Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're from. Thank you for joining this webinar. I'm just going to give it a couple of seconds as I see participants um, joining um, the webinar. We're going to kick off in a couple of, um, in about a half a minute or so. Okay, well, um, you know, again, thank you everyone for joining the call, joining this webinar, and welcome to the Investor Alliance for Human Rights webinar, which we're co hosting with BankTrack, where uh, we're going to focus and learn more on the finding of BankTrack's latest global human rights benchmark, which was published at the end of last year. Um, BankTrack is the international tracking, campaigning, and civil society support organization that focuses on private sector commercial banks and activities they finance. Their mission is to challenge commercial banks globally to act urgently and decisively on accelerating climate on on the accelerating climate crisis, the ongoing destruction of nature, and uh, the widespread violation of human rights. BankTrack combines nearly 20 years of constructive engagement with banks and banking initiatives and has strong ties with global bank campaigning movements, including grassroots organizations and partners, partners representing communities in the global south affected by banks, finance projects and companies. So with that, we're very pleased to have um, a great panel with us today and to be able to dive into um, BankTrack's benchmark. Now in its fourth year, the benchmark assesses the human rights policies, processes, and reporting of 50 of the largest private sector banks against criteria based on the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. During the session today, we will discuss the ranking of the assessed banks from leaders to laggards and highlight key human rights indicators where improvements are needed for banks to meet their human rights due diligence responsibilities. So as I mentioned, we're delighted to have some amazing speakers today. We're still waiting for our final uh, panelist to join, but I'm sure uh, she will. Uh, we will kick off with BankTrack's Ryan Brightwell, who will share information about the benchmarks methodology and key findings, as well as, as explore trends in banks' human rights performance over the past years. Uh, in addition, we will hear from two investors, um, Brandon Rees from the AFL-CIO and Lauren Compare from Boston Common Asset Management on how they use the benchmark data to engage with banks on their human rights policies, practices, and impacts on communities and rights holders. At the end of uh, that discussion, participants will have the opportunity to ask questions of the panelists. Please feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A box and not the chat box. Uh, we will only be monitoring the Q&A box for questions, so please do put those questions in as we um, as we progress through this. Um, and so uh, without sort of further ado, I'm going to hand this over to uh, Ryan Brightwell, who is the Director of Research and Communications for BankTrack and leads its human rights campaign work. Ryan has been working at the intersection of finance, human rights, and sustainability for over 15 years in both civil society and private sector roles. And with that, uh, Ryan, over to you. And thank, thank you. Thank you, Anita. Thanks very much for, for the uh, introduction. And uh, thanks to everyone for, for joining. And Happy New Year to you all. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. Uh, let, me, let me hope that I share the, the right screen. Uh, is that uh, is that working? Can, uh, yes, can that's you see perfect. The, yeah, can that's you perfect. see the slides? Great stuff. Um, so um, yes, so thank you very much. And welcome to this presentation uh, about Bank Track uh, Human Rights Benchmark. Uh, I also want to acknowledge my my colleague Julia Barbos at Bank Track, who's the the lead author of this report alongside me, and who would be giving this presentation, but is uh, off enjoying a, a well deserved holiday. Um, Anita already gave uh, gave a quick introduction to uh, to BankTrack. We're uh, we're based in the Netherlands, uh, and we're we're focused on private sector banks, commercial banks globally uh, around the world. And we we track banks, we campaign uh, for better practice among commercial banks, 
and we support other civil society groups and communities in their own uh, engagement with the banking sector. Uh, we were founded in 2003. As Anita mentioned, we have, we have a new mission to, to challenge commercial banks to act urgently and decisively on these four interrelated global emergencies, uh, as Anita already mentioned. So human rights uh, benchmark, which I'm gonna talk about today, uh, is of course part of our human rights campaign. And uh, the, the human rights campaign has been focused since, since 2011, since the UN guiding principles uh, came into play and were fully endorsed by the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, our campaign has been focused on uh, advocating for the full implementation of the UN guiding principles by the banking sector. So benchmarking banks on their implementation of the guiding principles has been one core stream of this work, but it's not the only aspect of our human rights campaign. We also work on what we term uh, dodgy deals, companies or projects with damaging impacts on the environment, human rights and society, which we profile on our website and campaign on. We also engage with banks and with sector initiatives such as the Equator Principles, uh, and we've produced policy briefings on topics including transparency in the banking sector and grievance mechanisms in the sector, which, uh, which can be found on our, on our website. So we also work in several coalitions campaigning on specific uh, aspects of the banking sector's human rights impacts. And I want to, want to discuss a few of these uh, particularly because they point to some of the, the current live issues really in the, in the banks and human rights space. These are, these are why, we're, why we're working on benchmarking human rights um, in the first place. So firstly, we're working with the Justice is Everybody's Business campaign, which is calling for the EU's proposed uh, corporate sustainability due diligence directive to be a strong and comprehensive law for mandatory human rights due diligence and for it to uh, for its coverage to include the finance sector in full, which is by no means a given, unfortunately, at the current stage in the negotiations. Uh, we're also a member of the Don't Buy Into Occupation Coalition, which is looking at the links between companies that support the illegal settlement enterprise in the occupied Palestinian territories and European financial institutions financing those companies. We're also working with the Business for Ukraine Coalition, uh, alongside the uh, Investor Alliance and, uh, and others. And as part of our work with Business for Ukraine, we have called on international banks to leave Russia uh, and to cease financing companies that are providing strategic support to uh, the Russian state in view of, uh, of its uh, invasion of Ukraine, including in the oil and gas sector. And finally, we're a founding member of the Stop ECOP Coalition, uh, and as part of this coalition, we've led the advocacy towards private sector banks to call on them not to finance the, uh, this project, the East African Crude Oil Pipeline, the ECOP, which is just one of uh, a number of, of new fossil fuel projects uh, supported or potentially supported by commercial banks, which are threatening people's rights and livelihoods as well as our climate. So before I get into the results of the benchmark on the next slide, um, I want to highlight also as part of our human rights campaign, we've sought advice on two occasions from the OHCHR, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the United Nations, on specific questions around implementation of the UN guiding principles uh, in an effort to resolve matters where there was a lack of clarity or a disagreement. And this has led to some really valuable guidance from the UN. For example, around when banks uh, might contribute to adverse human rights violations um, that, are, that they're linked to via their finance, which has been a hot topic in the banking sector, as you may know. Uh, and also when it comes to related uh, questions like banks' responsibilities for remediation and the establishment of grievance mechanisms. And the UN's guidance has, has shown uh, and really clearly established that banks can contribute to uh, human rights violations through their finance, for example, where their finance helps facilitate uh, an adverse human rights impact 
And in these circumstances, they, they will be responsible or co-responsible for remedying that impact. And it's important to emphasize, I think, that remedy is an important outcome, regardless of whether banks are responsible for, for providing that uh, remedy directly. And the banks have a role to play in using their leverage to support remedy, um, also in situations where they're not contributing to a violation. And this is something that we look uh, look to in the benchmark. So moving on to talk about the benchmark, which, uh, which as Anita mentioned, was uh, released in late November last year. This, uh, it was our fourth global benchmark of banks against the UN guiding principles, uh, following previous uh, benchmarks in 2014, 2016, and 2019. The first two benchmarks uh, went under the title of Banking with Principles, and the 2019 uh, one was the first to uh, take the new title of the, the Bank Track Human Rights Benchmark. Um, we also produced, in recent years, two regional benchmarks, um, in 2021 and 2022, in fact, assessing large second-tier banks, which are headquartered in Africa and in Asia, respectively. And last year, we published a report titled uh, Action Speak Louder, which assessed how banks respond to specific allegations of adverse human rights impacts. And that's also published as part of the, the wider benchmarking project. And this the new benchmark incorporates an update to that research, which extends the analysis to now over 150 instances in which banks have been invited uh, or asked to respond regarding specific impacts linked to their finance. So this brings us to the 2022 uh, benchmark. And to give a bit of an overview of the project, the, the scope, the report assesses 50 uh, large global banks based on a list of the, the largest banks in the world by assets with some adjustments, for example, for better regional balance. Uh, the criteria, there are 14 criteria um, on, in four categories. The criteria are based closely on the text of the UN guiding principles themselves. Our aim in developing the methodology over the years that we've produced this benchmark has really been to look at what the UN guiding principles say that businesses should be doing in the principles that create responsibilities for business and assess our banks showing how they are doing these things based on their publicly available disclosures. So our criteria look at policies, human rights, due diligence, reporting and remedy. And we give a score of one, 0.5 or naught against each criteria leading to a total of 14 available points. Uh, and we've ranked banks from laggards to leaders uh, based on these scores. And for the first time with this year's benchmark, we've added uh, three new criteria in a fifth category, assessing banks' responses to specific human rights impacts as, as sort of trialed in the Action Speak Louder report, which I described before. Uh, these scores um, are also, well, in each in each instance in which banks are approached, they're also scored with a one, 0.5 or zero. Um, and these scores are then averaged for each bank, leading to an overall score between one and three. And because of the different approach here with average scores on the one hand and scores per bank on the other, these are presented separately and the response tracking scores are not added to the results of the categories one to four. In terms of our process, uh, all banks have been provided with draft results through the process of putting together the benchmark and all but 12 of the 50 banks responded to this call for feedback and mostly with, with detailed comments on the, the draft scores, which is an all time high level of engagement for our benchmark, which we're, which we're very pleased with. Uh, and each the rationale for each of these scores uh, is included on 50 separate web page appendices to the report, which are linked to in the report. So we provide as much transparency as possible about our rationale for each score, banks responses uh, on each score and our assessment of banks responses. So what did we find? Um, well, the headline finding of the benchmark is that, uh, that 11 years on since the unanimous endorsement of the guiding principles uh, at the UN Human Rights Council, 
uh, no bank is yet showing an adequate level of implementation of the principles. Of the 50 banks covered, 38 achieved a score of less than seven out of 14, indicating they're implementing less than half of their responsibilities under the guiding principles. And let's remember that these principles outline minimum requirements of, uh, of corporate behavior. We found uh, no leaders, no banks scored the required 10.5 uh, or above out of 14 to be assessed as a leader this time. The top performers were Citi, Mizuho and Westpac, all with, uh, with nine points. Uh, and among the poorest performers, scoring three points or less out of 14 were Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, uh, DZ Bank and Commerce Bank in Germany, as well as BPCA Group, uh, which owns Natixis in France, and uh, also all of the Chinese banks assessed. And this full table I appreciate is probably Difficult to read on this slide, but please do refer to the uh, the full report for, for that, uh, that summary table of results. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time discussing uh, individual banks results uh, on this, uh, this presentation, uh, although happy to have separate conversations with those later. We wanna focus on the overall findings. Some more positive news is that there, there have been some modest improvements since our last benchmark in 2019 the average score moved from four to five out of 14, uh, which, is, which is welcome, especially since when we, when we looked at this in 2019, we, we really saw virtually no uh, progress over, over that three year period. So, uh, so it's, it's welcome to see, uh, see some advances in the sector. And 33 banks, in fact, improved their score between 2019 and 2022, some quite significantly by three points or more. Some of the biggest improvements were from Mizuho in Japan, which as I mentioned is now in the, the top three, uh, Bank of America, Societe Generale in France and TD Bank in Canada. Um, and as a result of these shifts, many more banks were ranked as uh, followers this time uh, and fewer as laggards when compared to 2019. However, we see uh, a lot less movement at the, the top of the table where there remains a significant need for improvement as we will see. So with the remaining time uh, available here, I want to dive into the results, uh, some of the specific uh, criteria and results. Uh, to keep to time, I'm, I'm not going to discuss every result, but I wanna pick out some of the most important findings in each area. Um, on policy, we see that most banks do now have a human rights policy in place, which includes a clear commitment to respect human rights in line with the guiding principles. Uh, 42 banks out of 50, making this the benchmark requirement on, bank, on which banks score most strongly. We also look for the policy to be approved at the highest level of the business, uh, which is the board of directors or the CEO with oversight on human rights matters from the board. As you can see, uh, the 1.2, the picture is more mixed here. Um, and from 1.3, we can see only 28 banks are clearly indicating that their human rights policy extends to the entirety of their business operations, including their, their lending activities, their asset management, their bond underwriting, where the banks engage in these impacts. And uh, finance is, of course, the, the area where we see the, the, the greatest number and the greatest severity of human rights uh, uh, impacts occurring. So it's particularly important that the policies uh, extend to uh, a bank's finance. We have five criteria on due diligence. So these run over this slide and, and the next one. Firstly, does the bank describe how it carries out human rights due diligence? And the largest group of banks score a half point here, indicating they have a process in place but that this is limited in scope or poorly described. 2.2 uh, consultation remains a major gap. Uh, no bank achieved a full score here as banks are not showing how they include the views of rights holders in their due diligence process in any sort of systematic way. Um, and as you can see, two large red bars here show uh, some prominent gaps for our remaining due diligence criteria. 2.4 shows that most banks uh, still fail to indicate whether they have a process in place for assessing 
uh, whether they cause or contribute to adverse human rights impacts through their finance. Uh, 11 banks compared to only four in 2019 indicate that they do have such a process in place, but fail to describe it. Uh, so it's a low number, but some improvement there. Uh, we can consider that if banks are to play a role in remedying adverse human rights impacts, they need to have a process for assessing whether or not they are contributing to those impacts and when they're only directly linked. Moving on to reporting, uh, most banks' human rights reporting, sadly, still, you know, 11 years on from the guiding principles is, is critically underdeveloped. Uh, in most cases, bank reporting is, is limited to, to basic reporting on, on developments like policy revisions, on training exercises, number of staff trained. Um, 36 banks score a half point here, uh, whereas only eight banks formally assessed what are their main human rights risks and how they are being addressed uh, along the, the guidelines of the, the UN Guiding Principles reporting framework. So 3.2 shows that banks are, are particularly poor on reporting on specific uh, adverse human rights impacts and how they're being addressed, which is crucial in terms of understanding how banks are managing impacts in practice. Only three banks, which are Nordea, UBS and Standard Chartered, described at least one specific uh, adverse human rights impact that they had identified through their, through their due diligence or that was uh, brought to their own attention uh, and, and described how they responded to that impact. So we have a low bar there looking for just one impact at a minimum. Uh, and yet this uh, by and large is not happening. And in terms of human rights indicators, uh, a growing number of banks, 21, uh, out of 50 compared to just 13 in 2019 uh, had at least one indicator as part of their human rights reporting, although there was only one bank, which is Rabobank from the Netherlands, uh, which had indicators that actually relate to the bank's main human rights impacts. Um, and enabling access to remedy and the related question of uh, the presence of grievance mechanisms uh, is, is the lowest scoring area of our benchmark. And the, the crucial question of remedy, 15 banks have a broad commitment to providing or cooperating in remedy of impacts where it's appropriate, but no bank details the process for doing that. And no bank has provided an example of where they have provided such remedy in practice or even supported or enabled uh, remediation, which is, which is good practice regardless of whether a bank has, uh, has contributed uh, to an impact or is only directly linked. The second two criteria here show that uh, two banks have a grievance mechanism in place now, uh, which is an improvement on, uh, on last time, uh, a grievance mechanism for those affected by their finance, that is, uh, but neither in neither case does the, the bank show that that mechanism is effective following the UN guiding principles uh, effectiveness, effectiveness criteria. And this is despite clear guidance from the, from the UN, uh, the Office of the High Commissioner note that I mentioned previously that banks should be proactively uh, establishing or participating in grievance mechanisms for those affected by their finance. And it's also despite a ruling from the Australian National Contact Point that called on ANZ in Australia to develop uh, a grievance mechanism. ANZ has, has since done so, and along with National Australia Bank, uh, in the same country, of course, it's one of the banks uh, scoring uh, a full point on 4.2. However, this ruling has, has wider implications for, for the rest of the sector. It's a ruling that having a grievance mechanism is in line, not just with the UNGPs, but also with the uh, OECD guidelines. So we consider that investors, I think, should be mindful, really, that, uh, that banks in other OECD countries, which lack grievance mechanisms, uh, essentially all of them, uh, will be vulnerable to other complaints that use this verdict as a precedent. And lastly, coming to the new category that we assessed on banks' responses to specific human rights violations, uh, we started with 152 instances in which BankTrack or a, a partner organization, an ally, had uh, written to a bank regarding a specific uh, human rights impact linked to its finance, seeking a response. We, we found uh, that banks responded in 91 of these cases, but in most responses, in most cases, these responses 
were not uh, substantial. And this includes the, uh, the line that we very often hear when we approach banks on specific impacts, which is we're unable to comment on specific customers. Uh, this is a bit of a misrepresentation of the facts as banks can comment on specific customers where they receive client consent to do so. And they can also write client consent uh, requirements into their client onboarding process as, uh, as some banks do. Uh, and if this were a mainstream practice, it would lead to a great deal more transparency in the banking sector. So 36 times banks responded uh, acknowledging the substance of the issue or at least their links to the impact. And only 27 times did banks respond setting out some kind of action taken in response to the impact that arose, for example, engaging with their clients or investee company uh, regarding the issue. Uh, and it's important, I think, to, to note for, for the, the majority of banks that, uh, that consistently respond poorly, that there are banks responding, setting out such actions. Uh, we have not yet seen how banks show, we've not yet seen banks illustrate that they, uh, they monitor the effectiveness of the actions that they've taken over time. On this slide, we set out the results on response tracking in a more familiar format, averaging uh, each bank's score. And we see that most banks average score was at the low end between zero and 0 0.3. On action taken, there are two banks, as you can see in the middle chart, uh, ANZ uh, in Australia and BNP Paribas in France, which responded on specific inquiries more often than not by setting out some action taken in response to an issue raised. But overall, our response tracking scores often provide a counterpoint to some of the other scores in the benchmark, in that even banks that are scoring well on policy, uh, due diligence processes uh, and reporting are typically failing to show how they're taking action to address uh, impacts when inquiries are raised. And if banks aren't communicating well to stakeholders raising concern about specific impacts, uh, we consider this, this should raise alarm bells really for investors, as these are often impacts that are most likely to escalate uh, and cause reputational and perhaps financial impacts uh, on the bank. So our call to action for banks based on the results of this research, uh, we, have, we have five actions that we're calling uh, on banks to take. Firstly, enhance meaningful and safe rights holder engagement. Human rights due diligence is most likely to be effective when the perspectives uh, and experiences of rights holders are taken into account. Secondly, improve disclosures on how impacts are being managed and remedied, for example, in human rights reporting. It's a core part of the UN guiding principles approach. And if banks get this right uh, and affect positive change, they'll have a positive story to tell in their reporting. Thirdly, enable access to remedy and develop grievance mechanisms, provide a concrete avenue for accountability and also uh, effective grievance mechanisms can help to manage uh, emerging risks before they spiral. And fourthly, banks should respond constructively and speak to the subject matter when they're contacted regarding human rights allegations. They should certainly do that much more often. Uh, rights holders deserve this. Uh, fifthly, and, and finally, we're calling for banks to play a more active role in supporting effective legislation. Um, bank sustainability staff often talk of the need for a level playing field. And the, the current proposal uh, in, the, in the EU under which countries will be able to choose whether or not uh, due diligence rules apply to the finance sector, it risks undermining this. So uh, in the EU, but also everywhere, we're calling on banks to engage with lawmakers um, to ensure that uh, there is the proposed legislation, which is which is coming really um, in many, many um, environments, many countries, uh, banks should be engaging to ensure that proposed laws are effective and to ensure they don't undermine the UN guiding principles or endorse lower standards than many in the sector uh, are already implementing. So that brings the, the presentation, uh, my presentation to, to an end. Thanks, thanks very much for, for listening. And we're, we're presenting to you because we consider that investor pressure on banks to improve their, their human rights performance is, is something we very much wish to encourage. So uh, do feel free to, uh, to reach out uh, by email, my email address and Julia's email address uh, are on the slide if you wish to uh, discuss 
specific results of specific banks uh, in more detail. And uh, I look forward to the discussion to follow. Thanks very much. And thanks so much, uh, Ryan. That was uh, very informative, uh, really a mixed bag there where we are seeing some movement since the last um, uh, benchmark from 2019, which should be the case after four years, uh, but really still banks sort of dragging their heels in terms of responding to impacts uh, of their of, the, of their financing activities. So still lots of uh Lots to do there and lots for investors to really sort of take into account as they are, um, you know, engaging with banks. And that really is what we are uh, looking to discuss further in this next part of um, the session. I uh, wanted to say that uh, we had um, expected a bit more of a dialogue between um, our two investor speakers, but unfortunately, Lauren Compare uh, is, uh, is, is unwell today and not able to join us, but we're very lucky to have uh, Brandon Rees with us. Uh, Brandon Rees is the Deputy Director of Corporations and Capital Markets for the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, or the AFL-CIO. Uh, the AFL-CIO is a federation of 56 labor unions who represent 12.2 million members, and the AFL-CIO's Office of Investment, where Brandon works. Uh, it promotes the interest of workers' funds in the capital markets by leading corporate governance, shareholder initiatives, and advocating for legislative and regula regulatory um, reform. So with that, and I'm glad that we have Ryan as well here, and Ryan, feel free to sort of, you know, participate in this conversation, uh, but really wanting to hear from you, Brandon, you know, um, um, the bank track, you know, can you really speak to us more about any trends you have seen in terms of your engagement with the banks on their human rights performance since the 2019 benchmark was released to the one that we're seeing now in 2022? Maybe you can talk a little bit about what impacts you see um, that the benchmark report has on banks' performance in terms of uh, their human rights responsibilities. Absolutely. And, and thank you, Anita, for all of ICCR's support for uh, shareholder advocacy in the banking sector. And of course, for uh, BankTrack for your informative human rights benchmark. And we look forward to reviewing the, uh, the results of the most recent version. Um, when people think of human rights, they often think about child labor or forced labor violations that can occur in the company's upstream or downstream uh, value chains and their supply chains. Uh, however, for many companies, the biggest human rights footprint uh, and the biggest uh, risk for human rights violations is often in the company's own direct workforce uh, that that operate its that that are involved in its operations. And of course, the the ILO court conventions define five core human rights: uh, the prevention of child labor, prevention of forced labor but also uh, freedom uh, from discrimination and, and freedom to organize and collectively bargain. And, and, and the most recently uh, recognized international human right, the right to a, a safe and healthy workplace. Um, in recent years, we've seen a, a greater willingness for financial services companies to engage, uh, particularly on racial equity issues. Uh, and of course, at least in the United States, uh, the banking sector has a longer journey than, than other industries. Uh, given the legacy of uh, discrimination and, and redlining and other historic forms of discrimination in, in, in bank lending, uh, as well as the need to improve workforce diversity at all levels uh, of the company. Uh, and this is, in my view, has really been brought about by the Black Lives Matter movement that has created positive change and the willingness for all companies to seek to improve their diversity, equity, and inclusion. So two years ago, the AFL-CIO submitted shareholder resolutions uh, urging a number of banks, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, and US Bank Corp to adopt uh, a diverse candidate search policy for all employees. Uh, in the US, it's known as, as the Rooney Rule, uh, uh, which is a requirement to consider uh, qualified diverse candidates uh, for uh, for uh, all, all job openings. And this has been uh, used very successfully in the United States to help diversify boards of directors. And we think it also makes sense for the workforce as a whole. And we were pleased uh, to see that uh, 
that uh, all the banks that we engaged with uh, uh, were willing to uh, adopt or improve uh, their uh, practices uh, regarding the use of diverse uh, candidate search policies, and, and none of those proposals went to a vote. Um, now, of course, uh, you know, as allegations uh, about the NFL's implementation of the Rooney Rule uh, uh, have shown, uh, a diverse candidate search policy is not a silver bullet to achieving uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Uh, employers have to apply the Rooney Rule uh, earnestly and in good faith in order to have a, a beneficial effect on their, their workforce's diversity. And in fact, we'd seen uh, allegations at one of those banks that we had, uh, we had withdrawn our proposal at of, uh, of also uh, circumventing their own, their own purported policy. Um, most recently, uh, since we, we submitted those proposals, we've also seen uh, high shareholder support for uh, conducting uh, independent racial equity audits of company practices. Uh, including a number of majority votes from the past year. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that uh, both Citigroup and JP Morgan have so far committed to, uh, to conducting a racial equity audit uh, in response to those shareholder resolutions. Uh, and uh, Citigroup, in fact, has already published the results uh, of their racial equity audit, and that's been positively received by investors. And I think it's an example uh, for other companies to emulate uh, in conducting their own racial equity audits. And thanks for thanks for sort of giving that that overview in terms of of, of trends uh, that you're seeing and you know seeing some po positive movement particularly um, coming out of um, uh, Black Lives Matter movement and racial equity audits and you know there are a number more in the pipeline so looking to see how that sort of pans out uh, but I know that uh, Brandon just sort of going in and focusing on an engagement that you've been involved in specifically uh, with Wells Fargo. Uh, and so wanted to ask you, maybe you can elaborate more on your engagement with, with Wells Fargo. In the past, you and other investors have pull, pushed Wells Fargo to undertake a human rights impact assessment to better identify and address the human rights risks. What were the outcomes of your efforts to ensure a systematic approach to, um, to um, Wells Fargo sort of undertaking that uh, human rights impact assessment? Yes. Uh, well, Wells Fargo is, um, for better or for worse, uh, one company that the AFL-CIO has engaged with as shareholders uh, for perhaps the longest period, uh, going back to the, the 2008 Wall Street financial crisis and our dialogue with the company regarding uh, its practices in, in, in extending mortgages and, and its foreclosure policies. Uh, and then, then of course, uh, the cross-selling sales scandal, which uh, became public in 2016. Um, yeah, I was pleased to, to uh, first meet uh, Sister Nora Nash of the Sisters of St. Francis of Philadelphia uh, at a Wells Fargo shareholder meeting over a decade ago, where I was accompanying uh, Wells Fargo employees. Uh, and, um, and since that uh, meeting, we partnered with, with her and other ICCR members to advocate for Wells Fargo to conduct a human rights risk assessment, uh, which they ultimately agreed to do. Uh, regrettably, though, uh, the company declined to make uh, the, the assessment public and instead uh, only published a summary of the results, uh, which was a disappointment uh, to us and, and the other proponents of that shareholder resolution. Um, most recently, uh, we have filed a new shareholder resolution at Wells Fargo that will be going to a vote at this year's annual meeting uh, that urges the company to adopt a policy on its commitment to respect the international human rights of freedom of association and collective bargaining. Um, as I mentioned previously, you know, under the ILO core conventions, the Declaration on Fundamental Principles in, in Human Rights at Work, as well as the UN Universal Declarations on Human Rights, uh, labor rights are human rights. Uh, the, uh, the, the right of working people to come together in a union and to negotiate uh, for improved working conditions uh, is an internationally recognized human right. Uh, but remarkably, Wells Fargo's human rights statement and their code of ethics is silent on this fundamental human right, uh, the right to organize and collectively bargain. Uh, now, you know, inspired by, by workers at Amazon and Starbucks, we've seen a recent increase in working people's interest in coming together to form trade unions and to negotiate for a fair return on their work. Uh, we've seen, for example, in California, Beneficial State Bank, 
uh, workers have uh, have successfully uh, organized a union uh, just in the past year. Uh, and this interest of bank workers in, in uh, exercising their rights to freedom of association is true at Wells Fargo and other banks. Uh, this effort to, to organize is, is being supported here in the United States by the Committee of, uh, for Better Banks, uh, an initiative of the Communication Workers of America, uh, who's filed unfair labor practice charges uh, with the National Labor Relations Board against Wells Fargo, alleging illegal retaliation against workers who have taken collective action uh, to improve their terms and conditions of employment. Respecting labor rights is not just a human rights obligation that all companies have, but it's also good for business. Uh, respecting workers' rights uh, raises employee productivity and reduces costly turnover. Uh, and the, uh, the Global Union's Committee for Workers Capital has recently published a new, new publication that documents uh, these improvements in company operations through unions uh, in, a, in a publication titled Shared Prosperity, the Investor Case for Freedom of Association and collective bargaining. So I welcome uh, all listeners to, to, uh, um, uh, to download the study. You can find it at workerscapital.org. Uh, you can also use it in your own advocacy as an investor with companies, including banks, uh, to encourage them to respect their own employees' freedom of association and right to collective bargaining. Thanks for that, Brandon. And, you know, really, um, you know, the work that AFL-CIO does in terms of its advocacy with banks to continue respecting workers' rights, uh, particularly freedom of association and collective bargaining. So, um, you know, do, do look out as well for the proposals that uh, Brandon has been uh, referring to. But before we kind of move to sort of the next question, I, I, or or to really, there are a couple of questions in the, in the, 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 the chat box. I wanted to just also throw it to Ryan, uh, to maybe make a comment, you know, particularly relating to the human rights impact assessment that Wells Fargo had conducted, uh, and that was a great, you know, success uh, coming out of uh, investor advocacy, but then at the end of the day, them not really putting out the full report and wanting to just get, you know, Ryan, your view, because you talked about reporting requirements, et cetera. Uh, maybe you can just sort of give us your, your, your views on what would really be expected once a human rights impact assessment is done by a bank. Yeah, thanks. And it was, uh, it was indeed, it was a, a resolution that we, we followed ourselves and we were, we were eagerly awaiting the, the results of the, of the human rights impact assessment. Um, and you know, ultimately we, we didn't see them. So it was, it was, it was very disappointing. It was also, uh, it's also quite an interesting approach to ask a bank to conduct an overall human rights risk assessment um, for its for its overall business. Uh, what what tends to happen the, the 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 banks that perform better on this are those that that conduct um, the the report on human rights really on an, on on an ongoing basis uh, on a, in an annual um, way rather than rather than. Uh, a, a one-off human rights impact assessment in, in response to a shareholder resolution. I very much recognize the value of the shareholder resolution in, in pushing Wells Fargo to, to take this step. Uh, but the banks that, that perform well take the, the UN Guiding Principles reporting framework as, uh, as a guidance, and they, they assess what are their most, uh, what are their most significant uh, areas of, of risk and they they regularly regularly review that in in consultation with with stakeholders. Um, so and this is the kind of approach that uh, that that Wells Fargo sort of alluded to in in the summary of their of their of their risk assessment. Uh, it is it is regrettable that uh, that they didn't didn't publish it. And I think uh, you know all we would seek for them to do is to, is to embed. Uh, human rights reporting in their in their business as usual to uh, to include it as something that they 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 put out every year and and work to to continuously improve as uh, as the better banks in in our benchmark are are doing. Great, thanks for that, Ryan. And uh, let's move to the uh, questions and answers, or the questions that are in the box. And I'm just going to read them out. Uh, the first one, and thanks, thanks as well to the attendees for these questions. The first one, I think, is mainly for you, Ryan. Uh, could you please provide some details on dodgy deals? Uh, 
how each projects are assessed by using company disclosure or also by consultation with NGOs and communities. In addition, dodgy deals are considered in the final assessment of the benchmark. Oh, sorry, sorry. In addition, are dodgy deals considered in the final assessment of benchmarks or is it based only in what the company discloses in public reports or communicates to you? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the for the question. Um, and uh, you know, we're, we're uh, a team of uh, currently currently twenty people at Banktrack, and the, the benchmark is is uh, is is part of part of what we do. And dodgy our dodgy deal work uh, mainly sits uh, separately from from the the human rights benchmark. And uh, what we term dodgy deals, as I say, they're, they're companies or projects with a, with a negative uh, impact on the environment and society, and we we tend to get involved in in advocacy on specific dodgy deals, not not out of some kind of um, assessment of what are the most problematic projects going uh, going on uh, with linked to bank finance at a particular time, but based on a campaign need, based particularly on communities that that come to us or that come to other uh, other uh, allies who, who know of our work and, and come to us themselves. So where there's a, where there's a, a campaign um, on a particular company or project, and where there's uh, where there's a sense that advocacy towards private sector banks can can make a difference. Where particularly if there's if there's a project which is which is seeking bank finance, um, and where we can we can provide advocacy to banks. I talked about the. Um, the East Africa crude oil pipeline. There are, there are several oil pipelines and mining projects which we have dodgy deal profiles on, and we detail the the impacts of these projects. And we we advocate towards banks to make sure that they're aware of the impacts, and usually to to help raise the voices of local communities who who are uh, sometimes saying you know we want this project to go ahead in a different way, but are more usually saying that we we don't want this project to go ahead. Please don't finance it, which is certainly the case uh, when. when when it comes to the the, the ECOP project, and in that case, we've seen twenty four banks, including the majority of the, the largest finances of Total, the company developing the project, have actually said that they're they're not going to finance this project, and it still hasn't received uh, project finance, which shows that this this uh, strategy can be can be effective uh, in in slowing and, and sometimes pre preventing. Uh, projects which which communities feel are damaging, and we always carry out this campaigning together with communities. So we're not uh, we're not uh, assessing uh, dodgy deals um, in a in our benchmark. We're we're campaigning on them separately, uh, but relatedly, we are also uh, as part of our benchmark assessing how banks respond when they're challenged on uh, on particular projects or companies, which may or may not relate to. Uh, dodgy deal campaigns um, and projects profiled on our on our website. So um, we want to see banks. We want to see banks be responsive whenever they're uh, whenever they're approached with with legitimate queries on uh, on specific aspects, whether they're linked to their finance or or rights violations within their own business or in the business of their their suppliers, uh, and for them to to respond constructively to uh, to uh, you know to acknowledge. The, the problems that are happening and to set out whether they are taking uh, taking action. Okay, no, great, Ryan, and important to sort of parallel courses of action in terms of the campaigning work and then the benchmark work as well and how that influences uh, financing going forward. Uh, the next question is for all the panelists, and so I'll throw it to Brandon first and then uh, Ryan for you to comment. Um, um, the question is, uh, what do you think is more likely to happen regulatory bodies driving change with new laws for financial institutions based on ESG principles or specific financial institutions to emerge as leaders and set the standard across the industry? Could both scenarios be possible? Brandon. Yes, certainly I think uh, both scenarios are uh, possible um, for, um, for uh, incorporating human rights, uh, both as a regulatory expectation uh, for the banking sector, as well as through the private ordering process and shareholders advocating with individual companies to improve uh, their human rights due diligence. Um, here in the United States, uh, we're uh, very supportive of encouraging the banking sector prudential regulators 
to include human rights and particularly the, the recognizing the importance and value of freedom of association and collective bargaining to a safe and sound financial industry. Um, the uh, cross-selling sales scandal at Wells Fargo uh, was first reported to uh, law enforcement uh, by bank employees who felt pressured by management to engage in inappropriate business practices. Uh, and uh, ensuring that, that workers have a voice uh, uh, at work uh, is the best way to, uh, to ensure sound banking practices. Um, that when workers uh, feel that they are secure from the risk of retaliation, uh, that whistleblowers will not be punished, and they have a grievance mechanism for human rights violations within the workplace, and that is the grievance mechanism of collective bargaining. Uh, that is, uh, in our view, the best way to help ensure rights within the workforce and to ensure a safer and sounder uh, banking industry as a whole. Great, thanks, Ryan. Any um, further comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think both uh, both scenarios are are emerging. I think regulatory bodies are driving change, and that's you know we're we're, we're sat in Europe, we have a global focus, but uh, but we see a lot of uh, legislative developments on mandatory human rights due, to, due diligence um, happening uh, in Europe and also and also elsewhere, um, and. You know, I think the results of the benchmark over, over the years have really shown that, that we need regulation to, to compel banks to, to respect human rights. We've, we've had uh, 11 years and, uh, and the sort of uh, quasi-voluntary uh, nature of, the, of the, the normative framework that exists clearly isn't, isn't enough to, uh, to compel banks to take the steps that the, that the UN has set out as, as responsibilities. So, so we do see regulation. Uh, as as necessary, um, and initiatives that, that fall short of regulation, like investor bank sustainability standards, uh, can also can also support uh, improvements in terms of financial institutions emerging as leaders and setting standards across the industry. We do see uh, institutions uh, taking taking a leadership position. We don't see any that are that are fully meeting the standards as as our benchmark shows. Um, and that's that's important, really, to show to show what's possible, to show that the good practice uh, is possible and, and is is happening, and to show the way to to other banks. But does it set the standard across the industry? Um, and the evidence of the the benchmark so far is is that that it doesn't. That, that some banks um, step forward and take a leadership position, but uh, you know the majority are, are still still prepared and uh, and don't you know receive. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of sanction or disadvantage from um, you know apparently are able to to remain um, in business despite despite uh, uh, failing to to meet those kinds of standards. Okay, well, I'm I'm just looking at the time, and I just wanted to throw two quick questions: one to Ryan, and then one to Brandon, taking the questions from the box, and then kind of wrapping up. So I'm going to go to Ryan first. Uh, you know, just very quickly, does Bantrike ask about types of allegations, and if so, is there anything that can be shared about it? Uh, that's the question for you, Ryan. And then the question for Brandon uh, after that was, uh, you know, the, the 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 question here was in terms of you know bank track as a benchmark, does does it influence? And I guess I'm trying to kind of paraphrase. Um, does that influence investment decisions by FLCAO? We know already that it, it, you use it to put pressures on banks to drive change, but does it influence your investment decisions? Um, maybe um, Ryan first and then Brandon, and then we'll kind of wrap up a little bit. Um, on, on specific types of allegations, I think this, this is an area where uh, mm -hmm. banks are not, not disclosing uh, nearly as much as, as we'd like to see them uh, disclosing. We'd, uh, we'd like to see banks disclosing the types of allegations that are uh, emerging uh, in their in their reporting and particularly how they deal with it. This is this is an area where we'd like to see uh, investor uh, pressure. Uh, I think investor, you know, if banks are engaging, if investors are engaging with banks, they can look at uh, look at banks' uh, sustainability reporting and and dig into 
uh, is the reporting on specific impacts? And, and if not, ask banks, what, what are the kinds of human rights impacts and allegations that are arising in practice and how are you, how are you dealing with them? I think that's uh, it's an important question for investors to, to be asking and to, to be getting to the root of. Great, thanks, Ryan. Um, Brendan? Yes, well, corporate disclosure serves two purposes, uh, both to inform investment decision-making as well as to inform uh, share owners, uh, proxy voting, and, and active ownership of the companies uh, that they're investors in. Uh, and I see uh, uh, efforts like, uh, like Bank Track's report as being informative uh, of both of those two goals. And it's particularly important uh, when there are gaps in existing disclosure regimes, uh, for example, uh, bank disclosure on their human rights compliance uh, that can be filled in and more importantly be uh, uh, comparable that there needs to be uh, um, information that can be uh, compared between banks in order to inform those investment decisions as well as proxy voting and ultimately with the goal of lifting up the industry as a whole. So I do I do think that reports like Bank Track are, are uh, is very very helpful in uh, in informing that responsible investment practices uh, both for those who are making individual investment decisions uh, as well as uh, as well as active owners through proxy voting. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Brandon, for that. And, you know, um, I, I was just going to kind of wrap up a little bit with, uh, in fact, the last question that was asked here, and I'm kind of going to provide a little bit of that response, which is, you know, how do we think the data from benchmark from the, the bank track benchmark could be used to push banks to improve impacts when below average performances appear to be the general industry standard. And uh, what we are hoping to do, you know, and 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 really to try to sort of enable uh, investors to bring their voice and amplify the need for um, um, uh, better, for change within the industry is to put together really an investor statement. Um, and in that investor statement, um, you would have seen in one of Ryan's last slides, he put out, you know, uh, was it five or six call to actions to the banks, right? These are the same sort of um, issues that investors want to ask banks to quickly address and, 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 and take action. Uh, action to address this. So what we're hoping to do, working with investors like Brandon, like Lauren, and as well with BankTrack, who are in touch with the impacted communities, um, um, as well, and, and Brandon is, you know, in touch with the impacted communities being the workers or, or impacted workers, we really want to try and put together an invest in, investment statement, which sets out, as I mentioned, our expectations and call to action for the bank. So we're hoping to really work with you to pull that together, uh, hopefully to have something, you know, towards the end of this month. And so please uh, look out for that. And if anyone is interested in getting involved in that process, please reach out to me. Um, and so with that, um, I'm just going to throw it back. I, I want to thank our panelists uh, for a great discussion today, um, taking the time to spend with us today the great questions that have come in from our audiences. But in the last sort of, you know, 30 seconds, any last words from you, Brandon or Ryan, in terms of what we're hoping to see in the next two to five years in the in the finance industry? Brandon. Well, again, I want to reiterate my my thanks to ICCR and the Investor Alliance for Human Rights for all your leadership in, in focusing investor attention, not just on their obligations uh, for their portfolio companies to respect international human rights, but also as a way to create value uh, for both as in, for individual companies and our society as a whole. Uh, and uh, and very much look forward to uh, reviewing the most recent version of the Bank Track report uh, and using it in our own advocacy and investor decisions. So thank you very much for having me and uh, look forward to uh, signing on to the investor statement to uh, banks that you referred to. Okay, great, Brandon. Ryan, any last words as we close off? Just thanks, thanks very much for for the invitation to to present. Yes, I really look forward to the. Uh, to the investor statement uh, being developed. I hope, uh, hope many of those attending can, uh, can participate in, uh, in that. And, and I think it's, uh, it's one area where, where pressure can, uh, can really help make a difference. Um, right. Just in the last minutes of this, I've been, um, been sort of had a, had a domestic situation at home with, with an ill child. Okay, uh, no, no, it's no, suddenly no. appearing, which is, 
bit unfortunate since it's been slightly distracting so apologies oh, no no it's been great we have not noticed it at all thank you uh, <laughs> and and welcome uh to our our last participant uh to this call at the last yeah. minute but uh really um wanting to also stress the importance of partnership with uh, organizations like BankTrack who are connected to impacted communities and how that really helps to ground truth the work. But with that, thanks to all for joining the conversation today and goodbye. Take care, Ryan. Take care, little one. Bye. Thanks very much. Thank you. Have a good day.